It feels ridiculous to be on a job of this scale and to be using this little less than one inch brush. You know, this is, this is pretty crazy, but I need to be able to sleep at night knowing that my dove looks good from right, from this close. I need, <laughs> that's good. Even though it's 50 feet. <laughs> 50 feet is the closest distance it'll be seen from. I want this dove to look like it's glowing. This is Holy Spirit dove and it's glowing with lights on. So whenever you want something to look like it's brightest version of a color, you just use pure white and put a halo of the color around it. So these feathers, you can see I already did it here and I'm gonna do it on these. First I did it with my yellow white. This is white that has yellow and a little red mixed in. But then I'm gonna put pure white in the middle of that, leaving the color around the edge. Now, it seems like a ridiculous little sliver of color, but I'm telling you from a distance, it looks like a bright version of the color rather than just the white. So I'll just put this white highlight right inside these, leaving the yellow. And then this, this outline of the tail will pop out from that distance, but I'll still have my color of the more yellowish light. And you can see I got this special brush to do it. white outline on this guy see from way down there you won't see the detail but you will see this dove and he'll stand out because he'll have this contrast that separates him from the background you won't never see that little face though <laughs> Ben says he can't even see the feet. I haven't been down yet to see. I'm probably gonna laugh at myself for even spending this time. This is fun on wings. This is a fun effect on bird wing feathers. So I have my yellowish white mixed with my shadow color. And then everywhere I have this little groove in between feathers. I just take my brush and I make this sliver shape like this and it makes the overlap. shining through his feathers there. Final stroke, final stroke. Wait for it. Guarantee, done. Guarantee you do one more. I won't. It's done, buddy. Mm -hmm. Turn that camera off. I knew it. <laughs> when I walked out of that church and I had finished that job, I looked up at the sky and I was just looking at the clouds immediately comparing my work to those clouds and I'm I'm thinking to myself God those clouds are amazing that's so much better than my work my work isn't it's not good <laughs> and I immediately just saw everything that I wished was better it'd be so nice if we could all be free from the need to be at any level of ability and just be able to be thankful for our hands and whatever ability we have and enjoy that with without that without that discouragement of I, I don't amount to anything and so I'm not worth very much because I'm not this good. That's not true. I just want to warn you against that love of being as good as the next guy. It is meaningless. If you ask me, it's meaningless because I, I have experienced progression. I've experienced getting better than I was. And while I've had immense joy in finding success in one task after another, I never stopped having that wish, that wish to be here instead of here. You know, you get over the horizon and there's more ground to cover and you just want it. It's like the wealthy man that wants more money. It's better if you can just enjoy the process and just in, enjoy what you're doing and know that 
you're valuable even if you can't do any of it you know it has nothing to do with 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 what people are going to remember about you when you're gone people are not going to remember they're not going to miss me i should say because of how well i could paint that's not going to be what's missed uh, my family the ones i love the most are going to miss the time that that i spend investing and caring for them and that matters so much more than any amount of talent in the world so there's a million people that are going to pass me up just the same it's meaninglessness and there is no top to that mountain where you reach the top and you get to be the best forever that's that doesn't exist i hope that i'm never actually considered to be the best in any way and that i can always just be just a guy that's trying to learn and enjoying the process and i hope that i can encourage you to do the same let's do some q a Ricky Ramirez says, do you use a grid system or do you just freehand? There are times when I freehand on smaller projects. I always recommend using a blueprint of some sort, some kind of a rendering, because the more planning you do on a small scale, the less planning you have to do on the real thing that's big. So just because I can do it from scratch on a big scale doesn't mean that I should. You know, it's easy as an artist to, or, or as a painter, to do the method that takes five seconds instead of four seconds. No big deal, right? It's just a second. When you multiply that, you know, up, up to the scale of a two-week project, then you're not talking about seconds, you're talking about days difference. And so things can get real stressful when you could have saved yourself a few days or even a few weeks of trouble by just shaving off that little bit of unnecessary work. When I'm doing something that's for a client that I want to be my best, I do something quickly and then I look at what I love about it and what I don't love about it and then I change it and I use loose techniques so I can quickly work through those things on that small scale and then when I finally reach something that I can show to the customer and say let's do this then man does that save a lot of time and trouble so that's what I did on this I actually made a couple of renderings on on canvas and I just rolled it up and put it in my you know, on my carry-on bag uh, when I went over there and we used that and said okay now we're doing this cloud and when we moved to the scaffolding it was just a matter of identifying which cloud we were doing and then I, I didn't sweat it if I didn't do the cloud exactly. It was just for the purpose of not realizing later that I wish I would have done that cloud differently. And Sharon uh, Domic, Domic, I can never say these names. How does this massive painting differ from, say, the same sky on a bedroom ceiling? When I walked into that sanctuary for that giant church, the most important thing was where is the the most common viewing point where are people going to stand the most while they're gazing at this picture and so that's what matters to me is where is the most time going to be spent looking at it because viewers are going to be very forgiving of it looking a little weird from that place that they're not going to be standing but if it looks weird from the prime location right when you walk in the front door then that's going to be defining of the, the quality of that mural. So one room might be painted from the center of the room perspective because that might be when you first look up by the time you're in the center of the room, you look up and say, oh, cool, there's a sky there. That, that might be the case. In this one, there was actually a door on the side of that, that big sanctuary. So I made that my prime location. So everything else looks, looks very good from other perspectives still, but... I just made it to look best from that one. It's valuable to identify a prime viewing point of perspective so that you are painting it from a perspective. Otherwise, it might just look like a flat wallpaper print and it might not look like my clouds were going up into the sky. So better to choose a perspective and make that one look good and, and then it looks a little distorted from other angles than to have no perspective at all. And thank you, Sharon, for that very kind compliment. I appreciate that very much. Valentina Tarasiuk says, 
You're right about showing light in a dark world. I'm paraphrasing to make this shorter. I was asking to get your idea on how to decorate the stage background so it will represent the city of light. So <laughs> here I was, you know, sharing my great words of wisdom, thinking that that was what was asked for. I I'm an idiot. I'm an idiot. You were just asking for practical painting advice. So, I mean, orange and blue, that's, that's what I would do. I would, I would make the city uh, uh, kind of orangey because that's just what I like. That's my favorite light scheme is when the light is kind of orangey colored and, and the blue makes for nice contrast because then if, if you're not able to have the high contrast or, or if it's not as lit up, then you at least still have the color contrast of opposite colors. Something else I really like is, is when you have a real good lighting effect like that, I think it looks super cool to put like a real light grayish blue border, just real thin strip, especially if they have that orange color to them because it, it just makes it look like it's lighting up from the middle and the edges are kind of catching the reflection. Just thoughts. Jessica Thang says, when did you first start painting? Did you study art in school? Yeah, I studied art in school and I mostly studied it on the back of my math assignments during math class. Probably more social studies than, than anything. That's why I know nothing about history. <laughs> I, I did pretty bad in school to be honest, completely honest, and I spent most of my time just drawing pictures on my homework. I wish that I would have paid a lot of attention in school because I think that the teachers had a lot to offer and really wanted to help, but I was just too stubborn and just thought the world of myself. And I just couldn't take direction. And so, you know, 10 years of manual labor helped me to have a different perspective on listening to what people say who are trying to help you out. So I am thankful, I think is the right word, thankful that I have gone the course that I've gone and learned what it's like to, to have to study and apply myself to hone a skill beyond what just comes naturally. If you really want to be useful to people, there's a world of amazing skills out there. And why should you be able to just whip out something that comes naturally without having to do some work to hone it into a refined skill. I didn't study in school, I didn't go to college, but I spent a lot of time just paying attention to how things look, practicing, doing experiments, murals that I hated, and redoing and taking twice as long as I should on jobs and making very small amounts of money because of it. And so that's kind of like paying tuition for me was, you know, these last 10, 12 years of trying really hard, taking jobs that really pushed me to the edge and that I had to like redo two or three times a lot of the time. I do want to remind you that I have a workshop coming up and I finally have the page set up. So you can go to learn.muraljo.com slash workshop and see more info on that. And I'm going to also post in the future uh, more about other workshops. So we're, I'm hoping to do a lot more of them coming up. So I'll see you next week. And thanks again for watching.